Hello and welcome to part three of my lectures on the geology of Iceland for everyone. In this lecture, we go from Thingvelli, the Graben of Thingvelli, to the uh, uh, geothermal fields of Geysi. So we continue in our imagination to drive along the golden circle. So we are here now. We will drive first to uh, certain caves here and look at pillar lavas and, uh, and all the structures here. And then we drive all the way to uh, Geysi to look at the erupting geysers here in this area. Uh, the numbers indicate stops where you would normally stop on, on the way if you were really driving. And those, uh, all these stops are described in detail in these two books. Uh, one which is the Glorious Geology of Iceland's Golden Circle, and the other one is simply a German translation of, of that book. These are meant for the general, general reader, and no special geological knowledge is, is needed to understand them. Before we leave Thingwit, however, let have a, let's have a look at uh, three outstanding uh, mountains that are seen uh, from everywhere in Thingwetli or Thingwetli Graben, namely Almansfell, Skalbreder and Hrafnabjörg. These are interesting mountains, particularly Hrafnabjörg, so I would like to discuss them a little bit. In addition, this view here is, is a very popular view for taking photographs because it shows the Thingwetli area in, in all, its, all its beauty. We look now to the north to Almasfell. Almasfell is a typical hyaloclastic mountain. It is probably around 150,000 years old and it is dissected or cut by many fractures, that is faults. Those I indicate here are all normal faults where the left hand side, that is the western side, we are looking north, has subsided relative to the eastern side. There are some faults cutting through Almansfeld that uh, have subsidence down to the east, like Almanigo, of course. But uh, uh, the main ones we see here in the top of the mountains, particularly this one, they are so that the subsidence here, so this part here, this wall here has subsided relative to this wall. So this is to the west and this is to the east. Then we drive to the north and we come to the most famous lava shield in Iceland called Skjaldbreda. We've seen it many times from, from a distance, but now we're seeing it a little bit closer. Uh, we are looking to, to the east. Uh, we don't see the whole lava shield, but we see the main part of it. Uh, the slopes are dipping maybe six, eight degrees here, in most parts slightly steeper in the top part. Now, this is a large lava shield, around 17 cubic kilometers, but it was formed in a single eruption. The eruption, however, may have lasted decades. It may have lasted decades, but there was a single eruption. And the magma, the magma, is what we call primitive. That means it's hot with a low viscosity, flows easily, and comes from a great depth. It's not coming from shallow magma chambers at 0 0.5 to 5 kilometers depth. It's coming from a deep seated reservoir at 15, 20, or even 25 kilometers depth. And what is generating, as you see here, is beautiful, smooth, pahoi hoi lava. Then we come to Hrafnabjörg. Hrafnabjörg is a typical table mountain and was most likely formed in an eruption under the ice sheet during the last gla glaciation in Iceland. So it is probably around 20,000 years old, so much younger than Almansfell. And it has lava flows on the top, it has hyaloclastites, and then presumably at the bottom of the floor here is pillow lava. But let's now see how table mountains fall. Well, we have a good analogy 
from a recent eruption, namely the eruption of Surtsey in 1963 to 1967. That was an island forming offshore South Iceland. This is the South Iceland coast here with mountains. And here are the Vestmanair Islands. So Surtsey formed in 1963 to 1967 and is entirely analogous to Table Mountains, except the sides here, the slopes are not as steep because they didn't have any, it didn't have any glacier to, to constrain its, its geometry. So obviously this was formed in the sea and many, many islands uh, on the sea bottom are formed in a similar way to this one. But let's look now better at how we believe real table mountains inside an ice sheet form. That we see here. So in A is the beginning of the eruption. We have the ice sheet here and the eruption melts uh, a water filled cavity here inside the ice that is subsidence on, on the top, um, a water filled cavity and uh, forms a pillow lava. This is the feet of dike here. Eventually uh, the eruption melts through the whole ice and the subsidence here and forms a lake. As the, as the pillow lava pile or mountain builds up, the water pressure, the, the, the depth of the water decreases and the water pressure decreases and the pillow lavas change from pillow lavas pure into pillow breccia and then finally into hyaloclastite, this brown stuff here. If the eruption, as it has to do for a table mountain, if it reaches above the water level, above the level of the lake, then lava simply forms and it forms a little lava shield. This black one here is a lava shield. And then around, uh, around the lava shield is still this, this ice that keeps the, the slopes rather steep, the slopes of the mountain rather steep. So we have pillow lava, pillow breccia and hyaloclastite here and on top is a lava shield. Then the ice sheet melts in Iceland around 12, 14,000 years ago, and the mountain is standing there. And the, the, the elevation difference between the surroundings and the bottom or the, the floor of the lava shield is the thickness of the ice sheet when, when the table mountain was forming. So back to Ravnabjörg. This is the lava shield here, it's a crater here, lava shield. These are the hyaloclastides, somewhere here would be the, the pillow breccia, somewhere here, we don't know exactly where, and then deeper down would be pillow lava. Now we are going to leave the thing with the graben, and in doing so we have to cross the eastern main boundary fault. There are two other faults outside this one, this is Rabnagjau, there is Heidegau and Gildrholtsgau, so the, the total width of the Graben may be seven kilometers, but the main Graben is between Ravnagau and Almanagau, and then it's five kilometers wide. And as we see here from the air, Ravnagau, like all the big fractures and faults, or any kind of fractures really, is segmented. So here's one segment, here's another one taking over there, offset here, where the walking path is. They're offset here where the walking path is. We see here the road and cars for scale. The, the opening of Rabnagau is up to as much as 68 meters. 68 meters, it's not, that's not the opening here, it's, it's, it's further to the north. And the displacement, the subsidence from one wall to another wall is a maximum four. 14 meters, 14 meters. And the total length of the fracture is around 11 kilometers. So similar or slightly longer than, similar to Almanikau or slightly, slightly longer. So let's now leave Thingwedlir and drive further to the east. Here we are at the parking place in front of the famous caves we are going to see, Löygarvats Hedlar. Uh, first we look though, to look to the uh, 
to, to the south. And we see there a very flat mountain, very flat mountain. This is also a lava shield called Lindalsheidi. It's a lava shield, but it's not a young one. It was formed in the last interglacial period. So it's around 120,000 years old. And what, of course, it has been eroded by the last, last uh, ice sheet uh, uh, somewhat. But what we see also is, is a strikingly gentle slopes, maybe two or three degrees, strikingly gentle slopes of it. Now we walk to this direction here, uh, towards the cave. So we turn 180 degrees here and walk towards the caves. And what do we see there? Well, we see these caves in the higher class sites. This is what it looked like several years ago, but people have now built uh, some sort of a, a house here because 100 years ago, there was a family living here for a while. And I think two uh, little babies were born here in, in the cave when it was used as a, as a sort of sort of house for, for, for people. But this is the way it looked uh, some years ago. So we can look at it in, in this way now. And we see very clearly the brown hyaloclastite. Why is it brown? It is initially black. It is initially black, but chemical reactions gradually change it into brownish, brownish color. So let's now go in this direction here, in this direction, and up a little depression there. There I can show you the pillow lavas, the pillow breccias, and the detailed structure of the hyaloclastites. So here, first, we look at the hyaloclastites. What you see is that the hyaloclastites are all layered, and each layer is supposed to correspond to one explosion in the crater or in the contour during the eruption. And the grain size is supposed to reflect the power, the power of the size of the explosion. So let's move on. What you see here is most of the grains are very, very fine. This is tough, really, very fine grains. But then you occasionally large grains inside. And size distributions or processes that are so that most of the structures or the objects are, are very, very small, and a few are very, very large, always in proportion. They are called heavy tailed. And probably the best known heavy tailed distribution is the so called power law. They are very different from normal distribution. If you take the height of all people in a big group, you would get this kind of size distribution. Clearly very different from the power law. And power laws are very common in nature, and they're also common, in fact, in human society, but they are very common in nature. If you look at them, you see that uh, uh, they have eruptions, sizes, earthquake sizes, land size, floods, meteorotic impact should be here, and many more. And the fragments are mostly here from pillows. So power laws are extremely common, and as yet, how they originate is not really well understood, but very many people, very many scientists are working on it. So here are the pillows. And uh, some of them are close to spherical and have circular cross sections. They can also be uh, elliptical or ellipsoidal with a cross circular cross section. Uh, most of these we see here are 20 to 80 centimeters in, in maximum diameter, but uh, this one here is around 1.5 meters. This is my notebook here, also geological notebook for scale. Some of them become flat like this one simply because of the load, because of the weight of the of the overburden of the of the uh, rocks that are above uh, uh, the pillows. So here is a, a close-up of some of the pillows. You see they have circular cross sections, many of them. Some are more kind of triangular in shape. And you see cooling joints. You see little fractures here coming 
from the surface and, and, and into, into the pillows. And these joints, they do not start to form until the pillows have, con have cooled down considerably. So if the lava initially was maybe 1200 degrees Celsius, the pillows, the, sorry, the, uh, the cooling joints would start to form only when the temperature had to reach down to 700 degrees. You see also some uh, little holes here. We see it better on the next one. So if you look at this pillow here, which is very, very clear, we see little holes here. These are vesicles where gas has been escaping from, from, the, uh, from the lava. And we see that this, in this case, very clearly that the, uh, the joints are radial from the center, they're radial. And where do they start to form? They start to form here at the surface because the surface is the first part of the pillow to cool down to 700 degrees. So they start to form there and then they propagate in as the pillow cools down and they propagate in towards the center, which is here. So that's how these pillows form. And uh, they are always an indication of lava forming under under water, usually reasonably high water pressure. On sea bottom, they're extremely common, mid ocean ridges, for example, extremely common to see pillow lavas forming. And of course, in Iceland, at the, the, in the lower parts of, uh, of um, high lava cluster mountains, particularly Table Mountains, you see pillow lavas like, like here. And I said to you earlier, when we were looking at the Ravnaberg, that there's a, a change from pillow lavas into pillow breccia and then to hyaloclaster. Now we see that very nicely here. We are again in the depression close to the uh, caves. And we see here contact between pillow lava and pillow breccia. And then gradation into hyaloclaster. So we see them all here. The only thing missing here is the uh, is the lava shield. We, we would have to go very high up in the mountain to, to see a lava shield here. But we see the pillow lava, the pillow breccia, and the hyaloclastite here very, very nicely. So we have been here in number nine, and now we move back to, to the main road, to the main uh, golden circle, and we drive all the way to number 10, to the erupting geysers, to the geyser geothermal field. So let's go there. Let's go there. Now, hot springs, erupting hot springs or geysers are, of course, common in, in many places of the world in geothermal fields in the world, but they derive the names from the great geyser. And, uh, the Great Geyser is not, as I will come to uh, in a moment, is not erupting uh, very often these days. But the one who is erupting very frequently, every five to ten minutes, is another one called Strokur. And here we see the first states in an eruption of Strokur, namely stage A. That is when the, the hot water is flowing back into and filling the conduit, the pipe here at the surface. There's a stream here I will discuss in a moment, but the water is flowing here into the conduit, filling the pipe to prepare for the next, to prepare for the next eruption. And the beginning of the next eruption is seen here in B, namely a half sphere, a kind of swelling or doming of, of the water surface just before the eruption starts, just before the eruption starts. And as I said, Strokur erupts every five to 10 minutes. So if you go there, you're surely going to see an eruption uh, of Strokur. And then we have the eruption itself. That's the third stage, stage C. And uh, they're commonly 10, 20 meters. Uh, the, uh, the fountains are 10, 20 meters. This around 10 meters. Uh, occasionally 30, 35, and that's, that's much, much more rare. So 10, 20 meters, but still impressive. And uh, 
very nice to see and uh, people are always impressed by, by seeing these, uh, these eruptions. But what is the mechanism? Why do we have these eruptions? Well, I think we know that pretty well, so I explained it here in, in a schematic way. And this is a very schematic illustration of the conduit uh, and an uh, uh, unspecified source or, or, or cavity. In fact, it's a fractured uh, reservoir, some sort of aquifer, fractured aquifer here underneath. So boiling begins in the conduit, in the upper part of the conduit. And that means the water has to, to rise. Why? because when the, the water is heated, it volumes increases, and there are also bubbles forming in it. And when the volume increases, it has only one way to go, because the conduit volume is constant, it has to go up, it has to be lifted up, which means it starts to flow here, out of this one, or form, first of course, form this half sphere, or this, this dome here, that I showed you in, in, in number B, in stage B. And when that happens, then of course, the, the pressure in the deeper part also decreases and further boiling takes place. And the result is an eruption, the third stage, stage C. But that's not the end of the story. When the eruption begins and water is transferred out of the out of the conduit, you do it into the air, that reduces the water pressure still further. So boiling goes deeper and deeper in the conduit and finally all the way to its bottom. And then the, the rest of the water in the conduit really boils into steam and the eruption ends in a very noisy steam eruption that we hear at the end of the eruption. So that's the, the total process. That's the total process. I said earlier, there's a stream here. This is an artificial channel uh, was made to lower the water level. If you lower the water level, we lower the pressure in the conduit, in the pipe, and therefore make eruptions more likely, more easy to achieve. But there are certain, uh, certain weather conditions that are particularly unfavorable for eruptions. In Iceland, because we, we are here in the Geyser area, this, this is a very open area to, to the northeast. And often we have in Iceland strong northeasterly winds, very cold ones in the wintertime particularly. And that cold wind cools the surface and makes it much more difficult for eruptions to take place. So there may be cases where eruptions are much less frequent than I indicated above because of cooling, cooling of the surface, particularly as I say, when there's a strong cold wind cooling the water at the, at the surface, it makes it more difficult for eruption to happen. I said earlier that this illustration is a very, very schematic one. We, we know, of course, there is a conduit, a sort of pipe here in the upper part that becomes at deeper levels connected to a fracture system. So obviously the pipe becomes more el elongated, more fracture-like with depth and connected into a fracture system. There's a set of fractures that constitutes the aquifers. The permeability, how easily the water flows, is maintained through earthquakes. The earthquakes shake the ground, and they may occasionally reach up to, up to this area. It doesn't maybe happen very often, but can happen. And uh, new fractures may be formed, or the old fractures are reactivated. Their openings or apertures are increased, so the flow of water is, 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 is made easier, that is the permeability is increased. There is also, when we have any stress changes in the Earth's crust related to earthquakes, there is also a concentration, magnification, raising of the stress around a conduit like this one here, which helps to open fractures or, or, or reopen those fractures that exist. 
So it's the fracturing, it's the fracturing that maintains the permeability that allows these geothermal fields to be active. So if earthquakes would die out completely, gradually all the fracture would be filled with secondary minerals uh, and uh, the permeability would, would go down and the eruption activity would uh, decline or disappear completely, as happened in fact to the Great Geyser, as we will discuss here. So Great Geyser uh, was very active in, in earlier centuries, but it was dormant, basically dormant in this, in the last century uh, until the year 2000, when there were two relatively large earthquakes in South Iceland. They happened in June, magnitude 6.6 .6 each of them. Uh, the earthquake fractures did not go up to Gaysi, they didn't reach so far to the north, they were further to the south, but the shaking and the stress changes related to these earthquakes, they uh, reactivated the permeability uh, around Gaysi, and Gaysi started to erupt again. So for a few days following these earthquakes in, in June 2000, it is reported that Geyse was able to erupt up to 120 meters. Nowadays, it erupts very infrequently, a few times in a year and usually less than 10 meters, similar to what you are seeing, seeing here. In early centuries, it was said that it could reach up to 170 meters, which of course is the foundation, found, 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 found fountains would reach up to 170 meters, would be extremely, extremely high. They're higher in the world, I know that, but it still would be very high. I don't know if that is really true or if it's a sort of an exaggeration or estimate, because in the 19th century, a scientist went there and measured the height of uh, some of the uh, fountains, and uh, they were measured somewhere between 55 and, and 60 meters. But it may be, it's possible that it occasionally erupted uh, extremely, extremely uh, high fountains. But uh, at least it is reported that following the earthquakes in the year 2000, the June 2000 in South Iceland, it became very active and occasionally reached up to 120. 120 meters, which is very, very high. So we come now to the end of this part three. And in the next talk, part four, I shall discuss, uh, among other things, of course, the beautiful, probably the most beautiful waterfall in Iceland, the Gullfoss, the Golden Waterfall. I will discuss how that waterfall was initiated and how the waterfall itself, together with the canyon, has developed. But at this stage, I simply say thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And bye-bye.